started with FFL back in January of 2020. I went to their national conference that was there located in Vegas. That's where I lived at the time, just checking out the opportunity. Went in there and I met a few people. I wasn't in for the hoorah and, the, and all, everything else and the hype. I remember I walked up and there was two agents, they were females. Like, oh man, we're making so much money, blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of was like, you know, yeah, stop with the, the hype. I don't, it doesn't do anything for me. And we went into a room and I remember I met one guy. He's like, yeah, I made like 210,000 and had no experience in this industry. And I'm kind of like, what? That's insane. I've been in the insurance industry for a while now. And that to me is almost unheard of. I talked to a few other people, same, same instance, same, same happened. Uh, same story, so to speak. From that point, I came in through FFL. It was all about buying the leads. It was a CRM that you could buy their leads out of. When I started buying the leads in within the system that they offered, I started noticing a bunch of duplicates. I would literally go sell a client and help a client out. And within a couple of weeks, I would have that, that policy had been replaced by another FFL agent. It was kind of interesting in that aspect. So how would they get that lead? That lead was supposed to be exclusive. They really encouraged over there was to build a team, get big, had different venues that you could use that. They had a, a program you could do go go high level it's a thousand dollars a month per seat so you could have up to five seats i did that a couple times and then when i made the decision to leave i was hit with an nda he told me i couldn't talk to any of my agents i wasn't able to talk to any of my clients stuff like that so there's a lot of things that i just started noticing that it didn't add up. i was encouraged to push particular carriers like you know i got called one time and they were like hey, why are your agents selling abc company why aren't they doing so and so and i'm like well i'm not in that house i can't really determine what's best for that client. So, I mean, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And in my head, I nearly knew he was trying to push the carrier because they get their bonuses over it. What carrier are we talking about? Americo. They're good for certain situations. Parkinson's, they're really good. I actually have a client. That was the only company that would actually accept it because of the Parkinson. They have incentives to push that carrier for, over others. And I just look at it. It's like, you got to do what's right. I've seen the commission grid. Americo pays 185 on their mortgage protection, whatever it's called. Traditionally, companies are paying 135 So there, there's a big difference between 185 and 135 and that's not including the bonus. Seeing the contract that they have for 175 wouldn't shock me if it's, if it's higher. And then they encourage you to get bonuses from the carrier as well. And nine times out of 10, there's companies out there that can beat that carrier and save the client you know, anywhere between 40 to $60 a month. So it's not doing always what's, what's best. But at, at the end of the day, you would see a lot of those clients, they would either cancel out because of chargebacks and stuff like that. And that's just going to be if you look at some of the interviews on my playlist, specifically the Andrew Holland interview, he says, quote, if I sell Americo, I know it's going to get replaced. Yeah, it's true. I run into clients that have Americo now and replace those policies immediately. It's a high price policy. And if they don't have Parkinson's. I was told by Michael Schlesser, as well as Andrew Holland, DUI and the third one was bankruptcy. They're good for as well. For certain uh, clients in certain situations, they may be the best fit, but they're not always the best fit. Now, I've seen people where they did a, a million dollars in Americans or Americo sales and policies, and I'm just like, that to me is insane. There's no way that carrier is going to be the best for all those clients. You figure that they get that bonus at the end of the year. The company gets their bonuses as well. So they're incentivized. They pretty much cut you off anyway. So You mentioned you got an NDA non-disclosed agreement. What was that for? They said that since I decided to leave that I couldn't talk to technically my downline. I couldn't talk to my clients for at least two years. I can't remember exactly all the verbiage that was in there. It's been a while. I never signed. Any. That was suggested that you sign, but you didn't actually sign it. Correct. In order to get released from your carriers, supposedly, if you sign the form that they would release you, but I've heard people signed it and they, they, they weren't able to get released either. According to the Go class ahead. action lawsuit that I was reading just a few moments ago, which is online, when you came into the system, they were telling you you're free as a bird. You come and go as you please. Were you in some what of a shock when you found out afterwards that that was not true? Yes, I, I, I was. I actually called a, a couple of people on it and, you know, my upline manager at the time, and I was like, hey, they say there's no contracts. Why are all suddenly we getting hit with an NDA? Oh, that's not a contract. I'm like, okay, well, what is it then? Oh, well, it's an agreement. And I was like, is it required that I have to have my signature on it? They're like, yes. If I have to sign it, to me, that is a contract. I mean, just call it for what it is. You seem like a pretty smart guy, but they were not respecting you as a smart person, apparently. I, I come from our military, so I, and my wife tells me that, hey, sometimes you're, you're a little too blunt. If someone's going to ask you a question, and you're going to be honest with them. I'm like, if you don't want to know the truth, then don't ask. So I'm not going to blow smoke up your bit, but, but if you look at it, call it for what it is. A contract is a contract. If I'm signing it and you have to have documentation, that to me is a contract. Right. I have to sign this in order to get that, so... And the person tells you it's not a contract. That's a huge insult to a, a relatively intelligent person. He said it was a business agreement. 
is how he explained it. And I was like, uh, just, dude, I, I don't even care about the, the fact that you're with the company, but you're a friend and you make me, you're, you're making me like want to punch you in the face, right? I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but look, you're going to sit here and say there's no contracts. We can leave when we want to leave. And no questions at all. Suddenly, now that's not the case. I have lost carriers because of it. It's caused more issues just me leaving FFL than I have ever experienced in my in the, in, in the insurance industry since I've been. Now, there's always lessons learned. You don't you don't know until you actually you go through it. There is an assumption when you deal with major American corporations that they're not going to defraud you. If you sue this major American corporation, which is based in Connecticut, you sue them in California for breach of contract and defrauding you, whether it be on the lead fraud, the release issues, any number of issues, because people said the training issues is, hey, you come into our system, we'll train you. Training, according to the interview I did a couple of days ago, was make phone calls. Mm -hmm. These are claims that could be adjudicated in a courtroom. When you sue a corporation, they have to come to your city in Northern California. They'll show up with attorneys that earn $1,200 an hour. For the most part, the people that I've spoken to, damages are one, two, five, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Any sort of trial where your attorney is earning $1,200 an hour is going to run a heck of a lot more money than the numbers that people have been defrauded on these leads. Uh, Robert Taylor of Minnesota, $9,000 on leads, zero sales. They speak to this individual, I say, hey, why don't you sue? I don't believe in lawsuits. God is good to me. If no one sues, this is going to continue. A class action lawsuit, as you know, has to get certified by a class. It goes to trial. You get a judgment. Probably three, four years from today. According to the class action lawsuit, they're earning between three and four million dollars a week in leads. Andrew Holler, Greg Birch, Tyra Hamilton, high level insiders, they all say it's replicated data. I've literally bought in leads and I've seen the duplicate. So I asked to hire up individuals over there. Hey, how come is it that we're re these leads get resold? It said to me, oh, well, because the agent has to take the code on this lead, and then you plug it into the system and submit it in, and then they remove the lead out of the system. That, that was never ex explained to me until now. And two, why don't you just take the lead out of the system? You figure that they'll sell them once, they'll sell them twice, they'll, they sell them three times, and you look at the amount of profit. I don't know how those leads are created. I actually called individuals and yelled at, are you guys getting, or getting multiple calls? They're supposed to be exclusive, instant leads, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Andrew Holler tells us that he buys data from the same place that FFL buys data from a company called Leadco at 50 cents a pop. Oh, wow. From years ago, years ago, old data. Old data for 50 cents. Department of Insurance, state of California is interested in this issue. The thing that excites the states more than anything else is an issue called churning in elder abuse. I did a Google search on the word elder abuse, state of California, four years in jail. That can be defined. Let's say a 65 year old person purchases an overpriced policy that builds up cash value as, as well as an incontestability cause. Someone comes back down the pike a year later from the same IMO, the same lead seller, does that client a favor and get him a substantially better policy? The IMO will have made two first year commissions. They've sold the, the lead multiple times. The elder has been abused financially because they've lost the built up cash value from that first year. They've blown out the contestability clause that has to be restarted again. The corporation who received that double first year commission profited. The reason that most IMOs will not go near lead selling because no one wants to go to jail. It's four years in jail in the state of California. California per occurrence. If you're doing this to 20 people, four times 20 is a pretty big number. Not something that most corporations want to go near. If the state does not have a specific individual who has experienced this financial loss, they can't do anything. I've spoken to these states and they say, if you bring us the name and that person files a complaint, we'll investigate. The agent can complain. I can complain. The best person to complain is the individual client who says, hey, I bought, as you mentioned earlier in the call, Americo. A year later, someone comes came to me from, let's say, Mutual of Omaha or XYZ Insurance Company offered me 40% more coverage for the same money. The investigator will ask the perpetrator, hey, why didn't you just sell this person the better policy from day one? Yeah. That's how they end up four years in jail per occurrence. Yeah. We are yeah, counting yes. on you to provide this information to the state of California. If you do a Google search, complaints, Department of Insurance, submit the darn information. No prosecutions generally run on specifics. They need that name. You personally, right. as an insurance agent, you need to be made whole. The damages that you incurred, that is done by the court system. The 
The great state of California is very protective of its citizens. That protection only happens when someone files something at the local courthouse. Right. Oh, yeah. So, like, when we come up with a, a client that has a, a policy that you, you that you feel that it could do a better job with, you just have to make sure that you do your comparisons. You go through your suitability, make sure that, hey, are, is this going to be the best fit for the client? Is, is there, are they going to save? Is it going to give them more? And is it going to be the, in their best interest to do so? And if it's not, then don't do it. If it is, then, you know, that's a discussion that they're going to have, you're going to have to have with the client. And then you make a decision at that point. It's a lot of the stuff that I've seen, just even in terms of, hey, you know, we were told to do one thing. And then after a while, because when you're coming into a new company, you don't necessarily know. You only know what you know based on what you've been told. You go do an America policy and then, you know, someone else would come up behind it, like you said, and, and replace it with another carrier. And you're like, wait a minute, what the heck? <laughs> they are getting that person substantially more coverage for the same price, it's worth a discussion. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Now you're looking at how other agents are stepping on each other because we're told one thing, oh, hey, well, I can undermine this person because I know there's another carrier that I can give for cheaper. It's going to give you the same amount of money across. Your fiduciary responsibility is not to your fellow agents. It's not to your IMO. It's to your darn client. Absolutely. Andrew Haller, uh, w which is one of the main whistleblowers, the title was Family First Life Agents, better to call the phone book. That was the title of his video. He looks for these people who did not buy suitable policy and he replaces them. That's what his call center does. And he's helping out the client. The only thing he does, he's making sure he's recording the conversation. He's making sure that it's really in the client's best interest, that the client understands what they're losing out, which is primarily the incontestability clause and any built up cash value. But if the if the policy is so bad, that may be in the client's best interest. It depends how bad the original policy is. Oh, yeah. It, it's interesting because you see even with some of the other products that they have, I'm not just talking final expense. You look at the ROPs and some of the stuff and the policies that they say, oh, yeah, this provides this, this and this. And you go in there and you look and it doesn't provide any of the stuff that it was set that that we were told that it does. And they'll push it as it's like a, a, a and it'll be also like a return of premium ROP term. Prices are ridiculous for what people pay. And then you're putting that money away for that 30 year time frame, not building any interest and you're getting a, a, a refund. So that's how they sell it. And then you can take that money and put a down payment on your home or whatever. The thing is, is that those policies, they tend to cost more across the board. So that's what their, their little pitches that they do on, on the back end of it. There's a lot of different tactics that these the agents over there use to, to get people you guys are supposed to be financial service professionals. The professional companies like New York Life, Mass Mutual, Northwest Mutual, these, these companies are really providing a decent product and they're really targeting middle to upper income clients who are forking over decent chunks of change in these retirement planning type of vehicles. The agents that I speak to from these companies never buy leads, like ever. Apparently that's the traditional way to make money in this industry over the last hundred years. Company figured out, hey, new agents based on having a a test. How, how long does it take to do pass this insurance test? You read the book. Maybe a week. 